From a closet, also known as the Jim McCarthy VoiceOvers World Headquarters Studio, this is the JMVO Weekly Primer. Please subscribe, rate, and comment via JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com forward slash podcast. This is the JMVO Weekly Primer, and uh, we're back in the closet. We've been taking the show on the road. Uh, for a couple of episodes uh, that the, I think the last one was about two months ago. So not exactly weekly as of late, but uh, I'm trying. I'm actually doing a lot of podcast production for other uh, shows and other friends and clients. So, of course, in the cobbler's shoes scenario, mine doesn't exactly get the attention it needs. And I apologize for that. So thank you for listening anyway. And uh, today we've got a great show planned for you, uh, bringing back a, um, a, a great guest who's extremely intelligent we're going to get uh, very cerebral and very deep in this episode but of course the primer is about making your life better through marinating your mind in good stuff my name is jim mccarthy owner operator and chief bottle washer at jim mccarthy voiceovers Com. And I believe that as business owners and entrepreneurs, man, we are bombarded by negativity every day. And it's the last thing we need. If you want to see your life and business change for the better, consume nurturing good stuff every single day. As usual, the primer is brought to you by Big Dot Lighting and Electrical. We are a Middle Tennessee commercial and residential services company that specializes in converting your business to energy efficient LED lighting and all sorts of electrical services. Now, bringing back on the show today is a guest that I had on, I want to say maybe episode five or six. He's a, an accomplished author, <clears throat> all, a businessman, entrepreneur, uh, speaker, and he's done a lot of things with his life in a short amount of time. Uh, I He's written a book that I think is one of the most pivotal books that has yet to really get some traction. It really talks about things and the cyclical nature of culture and society and how things tend to go away and how things come back. Um, a, a big quote from the Bible that I always go back to whenever people feel like they're being um, not oppressed, but they're, they kind of get down about how things are. I say, you know, this has happened before. There's nothing new under the sun. And there's no better way that I think it was ever explained was in a book called Pendulum. Now, if you've ever been in a meeting with me, undoubtedly this book comes to to surface we talk about it a little bit about it and of course i don't explain it very well so i'll bring on my guest mr michael drew once again thanks for coming to the show again sir how are you i'm marvelous thanks for having me oh man um you know as well as anybody else i'm a huge fan of the concept of pendulum but just for anybody who's new to the concept <laughs> as hard as it may be can you give it a nutshell explanation of what the book is about well i think you sort of did a good job of, of summarizing it thank you um look um blahi Sharad, the famous sports writer for the chicago tribune stated the reason history must repeat itself is because we pay so little attention to it the first time as you said in the book of solomon king david said the thing that has been is that which shall be and that which shall be is that which shall be done and there is no new thing under the sun is there anything where it may be said see this is new it has already been of old time which was before us my co-author roy williams and i as advertising and marketing folks wanted to give our clients a competitive advantage and we thought one of the best ways to do that was to predict the future how do you predict the future well you look to the past so what we did is we came up with a hypothesis that we challenged about the cyclical nature of time, and we went back and researched the last 3,000 years of recorded Western civilization, looking for a pattern in the way that human beings change their mindset from one ideology to another. Now, this is important in advertising and marketing, you see. Because when we do marketing and advertising, we're in non-intimate environments talking to groups of people, right? Our conversation here is intimate. But when we're talking to your wider audience, the viewership and listener of this, that um, straddles the fence of intimate and not. So when we want to know how to communicate to a group of people, then we want to look at non-intimate environments. And the biggest form of that are cultures. Right? And so we're looking at cultural movements. And so what we found was that 
obscurely enough that human beings are very predictable, that we're not unique snowflakes, and that we do the same thing predictably over and over and over again. Now that there's these two 40-year cycles, a 40-year cycle about we, me, the individual, and a 40-year cycle about we, the community. Now, neither is bad, neither is wrong. There's a beauty in a me and a beauty in a we. We happen to be in a we now, and so our value set tends to demonize that of a me, but the reality is both are good. In a me, it's about freedom and self-expression and looking and feeling good. Self-individuality, like all of these individual growth things are an amazing thing. And in a we, it's not about the individual, it's about community. It's talking about what's best for society as a whole. Again, a beautiful thing. But what we discovered, which is, I think, obvious to most of us, is that this is flaw in human beings. We kind of always take a good thing too far. And so when you take me too far, you become a society that is uh, plastic, that's phony. We, we essentially become a society of posers, right? And so we, we lose the beauty of a me in that. <clears throat> in a we, when we take we too far, well, we lose our sense of personal identity, and in groups, we start to demonize each other. And in fact, what we know to be true, this is part of what kind of scared us a little bit when we did the research, is that when we suffer the iniquities of loss of self-individualization and we start group demonizing, we start participating in witch hunts. And literally, without exception, every single witch hunt in the history of the known world has happened within 10 years of the zenith, the height of a we cycle. And so when you're in a we, you suffer, you start going into witch hunts. And so the idea in the concept of pendulum is to understand cyclically where you are, why you're there, and what that, the implication of that is to you individually, to your family, to your community, to your business, and to your, your country. And that's the kind of thing that we're, that really came to mind recently. Um, this, this whole concept pops into my head any given moment, uh, probably a couple times a day during various conversations going, oh yeah, that's exactly what was to be expected. If we look at the modern political uh, landscape, what do we see now? Witch hunts. <laughs> Witch hunts. Yeah. Uh, and, it's, and the timing of it is very suspect because if you look back 80 years ago as we were approaching the zenith of a we, uh, you guys, I think it was you said that uh, we were, we're about to live through 1943 all over again. Yeah, so let's look back 80 years ago, same time frame towards the zenith of the Wii. You have this guy by the name of Mussolini in Italy, this guy by the name of Hitler in Germany, and this guy by the name of Stalin in Russia, right? Mm -hmm. I think they kind of led different kinds of witch hunts. And then, oh, in the U.S., we had Japanese intern camps. Yeah. Right? We had the Red Scare. We had Joseph McCarthy. Well, yeah, that's a data point. That's one cycle. Well, let's go back 80 years before that. Well, we kind of had the Civil War and the Second French Revolution, and 80 years before that, we had the first American Revolution and the first French Revolution Wars. I don't know, Bloody Mary, the Spanish Inquisition, the Crusades, Salem Witch Trials, like all of it happened within 10 years of, of the, the zenith of a week in the same position that we are in today. And that's one of the things, I, the three things I wanted to cover were the witch hunts and what we're seeing today. Uh, where do you think it's going to play out in the next half decade to a decade, uh, being a great prognosticator based on the book's um, uh, uh, fundamentals and uh, philosophy? Um, I wanted to talk about the elements of the swing of the pendulum in terms of it's not me, it's you. I'm, not, I'm okay, you're not okay, uh, which is, I think, the stage we're in now, which enables the witch hunts. Uh, what we can anticipate next and the next, uh, you know, the downswing as the culture comes up and says, okay, I've had enough of this. We're going to start pulling it the other way. And um, oddly enough, Marvel movies, hero movies. What's the deal with that? And why do we feel so compelled as a culture to feel the need for heroes that are flawed? <laughs> well, and, and with that, we can also talk about the anti-hero. Because yeah. as we move to, into the current cycle we're in, there's a huge movement in, in anti-heroes as well. Not just heroes, but anti-heroes. But... Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting. First of all, we, we talk about witch hunts now, and it's easy to, to use that phrase. It's something that's being used more and more and more in uh, media all around us. And I, I think it's important to note that you and I aren't using this as though it's some new idea or concept that we've suddenly come across, right? When Roy and I did the research for the book, we started doing this in 2003. 
Yeah. Right. This is before social media. We predicted social media before it existed. Um, we started talking about the witch hunt before there was a witch hunt. Um, you and I had conversations for a long time, for several years, before anybody else was talking about the witch hunt. And here we are, right? We're now in the midst of this big giant witch hunt. And we're not going to get away from that. Like it is, it is the reality of a physiological, psychological shift within an individual when we take the concept of community too far. Mm-hmm. My community is better than your community. It's I'm okay, you're screwed up, right? But we, we while it's happening, there is hope, right? And I think that's one of the big things that people need to understand. Now, part of hope requires an acceptance that there's a problem. One of the um, great TV series, I believe, uh, from HBO that came out in the last decade was called Newsroom. Mm-hmm. And the beginning clip started with three journalists being asked, what makes America great? And, and the, the main character of the show saying, nothing, America, um, America is not great, right? And he goes on to explain, you can't fix a problem unless you first identify that there is a problem. And we have a problem. And the problem isn't based on intent or desire. I, I genuinely believe that most people, most of the time, desire to do good. We desire to help and make a change and make a difference for the better, not for the worse. I don't believe that Democrats or Republicans, conservatives or liberals or anybody in between are good, are more good or more bad. We're people. We simply have a different way of, of an angle of approach of, uh, of looking at something. Yet when we start having group think, then we start to look at that group as the best way to think and the best way to act. And that's not wrong until you start comparing it with other groups and start to say, well, I'm better than you. Really? I mean, you're better than me. I'm better than you. Like, that's something that we can objectively quantify and say. We, we, we can predict the future and the past. And we know. No, we, it, it's absurd. But it's really easy emotionally to be able to, to, to take our belief and just hold on to it as the truth, the only truth. And a couple of things that we point out in the book Pendulum that are the solutions to the problem is, first of all, being able to look at um, strong me leaders. It's in the cycles where the witch hunt was the least bad, there were previous leaders of various groups in me cycles that the masses could emulate and follow. And though they may have had disagreements and some demonization, it mitigated some of the worst parts of that cycle. And I think it's important to remember that current leaders are viewed through momentary lenses. <clears throat> and while we can support a leader in one area or another, our ideology, our idealism shouldn't be rooted in a we. It should be rooted in the me. When idealism is built and grown. We isn't about idealism. It's about growth of community. But you must do that based on idealism. So, so number one is to be able to have a strong idealistic me leader that represents whatever philosophy you have is fine. But look to that person as your way of, of creating a lens to view the world, not the current leaders that we have today. The current leaders that we have today, they're doing what they do. Right, they're human beings doing what they do. Good, bad, ugly, indifferent doesn't matter. They're 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 just doing it, and history will write whether it was good or bad, whether or not it's worth looking at them as someone to emulate. But there's no way to know that in the moment. We can only look back at history to know who to emulate. So that's number one. Number two, one of the things that we point out is that's really really important. And as a as a host, you do an amazing job at this. But it, it's to be able to listen without interruption. Mm-hmm. It's a really hard skill set to learn. And so many of us, myself included, listen to respond or um, don't really listen and simply want to be able to be seen and heard, right? We, we, we want to know that our, our experience matters and it's very difficult to realize that your experience and my experience matter equally. There's not a right or a wrong that we're equal as people and the experiences are equal. And so we need to listen without interruption to really listen and hear the other, the other person. And the final thing that is missing 
is the ability to understand someone who you disagree with so well that you can explain their position at the same level that they can explain their position. Because if we understand the opposite side's position and can explain it as well as they can, then it allows for empathy and understanding. Whether It doesn't require agreement, but it allows us to realize the humanity of the other person and to realize the intent of the other person and figure out where commonality exists. Right. And when we do that, we eliminate, we eliminate the, the, the witch hunts, right? The witch hunts are about uh, me being right and you being wrong. Well, what if we're both wrong? What if we're both right? What if we're both wrong and right at the same time? Like if we're not open to the dialogue and the conversation, then we're not able to, to, to have harmony, but we're also not able to really create progress. You know, one of the things that Roy said to me a long time ago from a business standpoint, he said, the winners and the losers in life are determined when the teams are picked. There are two teams that are central for your success. The first are the team of people you select to be on your team. And the second are those you select to be on your team. And I think that, that the values that we should be taking from the we is about coming together to create community, but not just with people we agree with, right? We're all on planet Earth. We're all this little dust speck in the universe flying around and giant nuclear fission piece of heat <laughs> flying through the Milky Way. And right, we're all here having the human experience. So the requirement isn't to be right. The requirement is to improve each other's lives, right? And so I, I think that those are the important things that we have to remember as we move through. And I would advocate against leaders that don't support that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that maybe the noise level getting louder over the years, especially with the use of social media and everybody having an opinion has um, accelerated the um, the speed of the uh, swings, if you will? It's a question that we're asked often, and the short answer is no. Mm -hmm. uh, the midterm, uh, the, the mid-level answer is there's no way for us to know in our lifetime. Yeah, true. Right? Because you're dealing with you're dealing with a form of, of evolution, so you won't, we can't see evolution in our lifetime. And the more complex complex answer is we are evolving as a species, right? So is it possible that technology, along with other things, will help us evolve as a species to, to change the cycles? Possibly. But what I what I would tell you is throughout the history of mankind, no technology, not even Gutenberg which is arguably more impactful than the internet today, change the physiological and psychological nature of human beings. Because the process, the, the cycle of the pendulum is the process of idealism and taking a good thing too far. Mm -hmm. And responding to taking a good thing too far with idealism. And that's a human nature. So what the <clears throat> mechanism of the delivery of the information is irrelevant at least as far as we see. Um, it doesn't change our psychology or physiology because we have new technology that allows for it to be amplified. And also note, the, the population of the Earth today is, at the turn of the last century, there was a little over a billion people. We're at almost 8 billion people on the planet now. In 100 years, we've improved, we've increased the size of the population by eight times. So when we look at the, the, the speed of technology, when we look at the speed of increase of the, the population and humanity, they're kind of the same in my opinion. <clears throat> no, I could be wrong. I, the, we could be changing and evolving and technology could influence us and perhaps at some point in the future we'll put implants in our brains and download data and information and it changes who we are. But so far, it doesn't appear that technology changes our humanity. So if Thanos was right, he'd only back us back down to 4 billion people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's kind of funny. In the, I, di I didn't realize that it was uh, we, we had gone eight times the population in the last 100 years. That's something new to me. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's not an exact. I mean, I'm quoting yeah. on that as exact. Seven and a half times or whatever. But it, it's roughly that. Yeah, so we, 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 modern technology and modern science and modern medicine is pretty amazing. So it's amazing how, you know, here we are getting to the zenith of a we, which is a, to occur about uh, three years from now or so. And uh, wait, wait. 
we're seeing the 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 uh, the, the effects of what that's going to look like. Um, Right now, we should experiencing, according to the book, I guess in the last uh, two to three years, we should start hearing the vestiges of the voices in the wilderness that are going to shape the next 10 to 20 year uh, downswing, correct? Well, no, we've got another, uh, so it starts 10 years out. Um, Literature and technology is in, in year 30, so that'll be 2033. So we've got another 10 years of de-evolution and niceness and, and kindness. And that's the kind of thing, you know, here I am in this podcast of, uh, you know, part of me, the reason why I started it was I got involved in a lot of those conversations, a lot of those political arguments on Facebook that did absolutely nothing but, you know, well, I'm going to plant the seed and hopefully change the way someone thinks. And no, you're not changing the way anybody thinks, only the way they think about you. Um, and that's that's been a big belief of mine. I... Uh, when I was in the car business, someone told me something pretty incredible, and it's and it's very true to this day. The only control you have over anything is the immediate 360 degree sphere around you, um, and that you know every four years you have an election you can partake in, and that's about it. You know, all we can do is really get riled up. And I talk to people on Facebook. I'm like, what do you get out of this? You know, what arguing with people that you don't even know? Is you, do you control their thoughts? I mean, you know, what, what do you derive? What kind of pleasure do you derive and joy do you derive out of these experiences? And a lot of the time as well, I think I'm going to change their mind. Really? Do you? Concentrate on the stuff you can control. Let me, let me tell, say two things yeah. that, that's to your audience. Most Democrats are not, not bad people. Right. Most Republicans are not bad people. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's so easy to get caught up in the emotion of what is and what your belief is that that you lose sight of what's important. And I I think um, a concept I've been playing around with, I I think what we need right now is to find Don Quixote. Mm. And that's uh, for those of you who are listening or watching this. Um, the, the the gentleman that that Michael is, is mentioning is a, a guy named Roy H. Williams, who's a, uh, a just a prolific thinker, very uh, very cerebral gentleman. And uh, they 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 have an organization in um, Austin, Texas, called the Wizard Academy. That if you ever really wanted to take your writing or your advertising to a whole different level, I would suggest looking into it. It's at uh, wizardacademy.org, I believe. It's a nonprofit, and it's it's an incredible experience all around. Despite what you learn and everything, I think the last time I was there, he was uh, he was deploying his wine line, and uh, that was that was that was a fun night. But yeah, yeah, and you, you bring up Roy in context of Don Quixote yeah. because the patron saint of the Wizard Academy is Don Quixote. Right. But I, I think that that the the reason he's the patron saint of the Academy is actually the solution to the need that we have right now. So one of the things that the Cervantes Society at Purdue um, believes about Don Quixote was that he was a Lutheran or Protestant retelling of the story of Jesus Christ. Now, whether, you, whether you're an atheist or a Christian or, or, or belong to a religion, the, there, are, there are characteristics of Don Quixote and characteristics of Jesus Christ that, that are very similar. Mm-hmm. And it was written by the Gil Cervantes during the Spanish Inquisition, again, a witch hunt cycle, Right, and it was meant to be able to give hope and inspiration to non-Catholics in Europe. So, the thing about Don Quixote, though, and Christ and beyond, is that you never knew at the time if Don Quixote was real in the book or fake. Right, no one around him knew what what he was really about. You didn't have a backstory on him in the book, and. He was always always on the errand of his Lord, and he always did the right thing for the sake of right. Right? It wasn't about anything else. He always did the right thing. And Don Quixote would go and do these absurd adventures because his Lord told him to. So whether that's Don Quixote or Jesus or uh, Buddha or anybody else, it it, kind of reminds me of the – the the um, crazy dancing guy video. There's a TED video about um, how to create a movement, mm-hmm. and they show this gentleman who's dancing in a field at a concert all by himself. And 
nobody's dancing with him. He's dancing by himself. And then the first follower comes on and starts following him. And he starts dancing. And that first follower brings in other people to start dancing with this crazy dancing guy. And what happens in movements is that that guy, the crazy dancing guy is the one that gets all the glory because he was willing to take the risk. But it was the first follower that was the one that actually built and grew the movement. And so when we talk about in Pendulum, looking at me-based leaders, we're looking at people that inspire us, not in a dissimilar sense the way that Don Quixote does, not in a dissimilar sense the way that the crazy dancing guy does. And what I think that we're missing is we all want to be right. We all want to be the leaders. We all want the glory. We all, there's a certain narcissism that technology has brought. And we, we want these things, yet what we really need is to find our own Don Quixote. We need to be the Pancho Sanchez of our own story and find that person who is willing to dream the impossible dream, who's mm-hmm. willing to fight the unbeatable foe who's willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause, as crazy as it is. I think that's what we're missing. I think we're missing Don Quixote. So he'd be the, that, that character will be the somewhat of a voice in the wilderness. I mean, there's, you and I He's had a meta- conversation. Yeah, the metaphor. Um, yep. There's a guy, we, the conversation you and I were having before we went live, and uh, you coined a term that was just dang perfect. Uh, we, you know, we're coming from the same space. We, we follow a lot of the same people. Um, there are a lot of, um, uh, I'll just say it, douchebag marketers out there. Your term, not yeah. mine, but I think it's a brilliant term. And it's one that I've been searching for for probably well over a year to, 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 to talk about the people out there that are not being authentic, you know, very transactional in their approach. And um, there's one in particular that's opposite of that, uh, old, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk, who is very, who's resonating a lot these days with uh, people who just want to keep it real. And right. that's the big resonation right now. Maybe that, maybe he's the Don Quixote we're looking towards because he's all about happiness and being positive and, and, you know, quote, doing the right thing, you know, building culture in their I, business and such. I think he is a Don Quixote in his field. Right. I think one of the important things to remember is that, um, to, well, for me, Don Quixote isn't a global person necessarily. Right. I think that, that you can find Don Quixote in your industry. I think you can find Don Quixote in church. I think you can find Don Quixote in politics. I think that in various aspects, like as an example, and it, it's used a lot by the Republicans, but it's not necessarily unfair. A lot of Republicans talk about Ronald Reagan. I think that's not an unfair Don Quixote, if you actually look at who he was and what he did, whether uh, if I'm liberal, if I disagree with Reagan or not, is an irrelevant point. If you look at what he did, how he acted, how he treated people, um, the values that he espoused, there, there's a, there's an altruism that exists within at least the the lionization of who he is. And on, on the liberal side, in politics, you could easily go to FDR or to JFK. Like there, there's a lionization that happens with their value sets and their belief sets and the way they act. And I think that 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 the idea of the lionization um, of these folks from an emulation standpoint is important. Right? I, I recently saw a um, debate, a uh, recording of a debate between Ronald Reagan and George uh, H. Walker Bush talking about immigration and their angle of approach on treating people in immigration as people is very different than a lot of the conversations that are happening now within the Republican Party. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I'm saying if you're talking about an ideology, if you're talking about um, emulating someone, we should be emulating the, the best of these people. So, you know, we, we can talk about FDR's affairs, but it's not about the affairs for FDR. It's about all of the amazing things they did to help the people, right? There's a lionization, a, 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 an emulization of these people that are worth looking at. Lincoln was human. He made a lot of mistakes. Jefferson was human. He made a lot of mistakes. But there, there is not. There's an emulization of these amazing things from these amazing people that we should be looking at. That we're not. It's why history is so important because we are bound to repeat history if we don't pay attention to the past on the negative and the good side. Well, it's bound to happen. There's like we said. There's nothing new under the sun. Now, the one thing that you one thing you brought up when, again before we went live was, uh, and I find this very fascinating happening in culture now. 
uh, and you mentioned it earlier, the anti-hero. And we're seeing it play out in uh, Marvel, somewhat in DC, and Star Wars. But you had asked me if I was a Star Wars fan. And, oh, you know, it's not, it's, it, yeah, I'll watch it. It's not exactly my thing. But, man, I don't know how to explain it, but it's almost embarrassing to bring it up in conversation with anybody. But I'm like a, a, a Marvel geek all of a sudden. And I don't know why I feel the need to have that kind of draw to those storylines. I mean, I must have watched, the, watched those movies over and over and over again. But I think about Pendulum. <laughs> It's, yeah. it's interesting because so in the in the mid 2000s, early 2010s, you had anti-hero TV shows and movies that were exclusively <laughs> anti-hero. So as an example, the original Dark Knight series um, with Batman was was actually the perfect illustration of, of Pendulum from me to we to taking we too far within within the three movies. But you have. You had series like Breaking Bad, and you had Dexter, and you had these other series where the main character was bad, but was the was maybe doing something good, right? Yeah. And they were they were singularly focused and quite dark. What we then I think we're in the golden age of TV, by the way, and, and movies, which is why we're we're seeing some of these things go on. But what you saw that um, Avengers, well, Avengers, pardon me, that these that uh, Marvel has done so well is they took their their heroes and made them human really very yeah. human. very human and if you think and about they, it they've done that since the 60s and dc always made these characters that were uh in you know infallible yep you know i mean superman if you look at the crescendo of superman it went from the 40s on up to the uh, early 80s and in the early 80s was the uh the the zenith of a me where yep. you know uh, the Christopher Reeve Superman was the hero of the day. No pun intended. Oh yeah, the, the heroes were perfect and clean and didn't do any wrong. But it's why it's why the Dark Knight series, yeah, for Batman was so different because everybody was bad. Yeah, <laughs> including Batman wasn't particularly good, <laughs> right? That's that was part of the part of the character. And and what Marvel has done is that they not only made the the heroes flawed. Mm-hmm. They made the bad guys not as bad, right? You could disagree with Thanos's logic, why he wanted to get rid of half of the universe, but his logic was logical and it was altruistic. Yeah, right. He wasn't. He he didn't desire destruction because he wanted to cause pain. His objective, whether you agree with it or not, was actually to eliminate pain. Right, and so it was interesting and controversial when when he did it, and then he goes to his farm to kind of retire. He's like, "Oh, well, is he really bad?" Well, I don't know. Is he really bad? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe that's a maybe that's an angle of approach. Maybe that's a view set. Maybe that's a value set. Right? Yeah, I mean, now, he, you look at his, uh, you know, the speech towards the end of the movie Endgame, and he says, you know, maybe the solution is just to start anew and, and erase everything. Because as long as there are going to be people who remember what was, there will never be an allowment of what will be. And I'm like, well, no, well, they give it a couple of generations and yeah, they'll, they'll forget about it, you know? Maybe, maybe. But, 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 he, but he's not wrong, at least in conversation, that's not wrong. Like it, we, we, can, we can debate the point, <laughs> but, it, it's, it, but, but it, does that make him a bad guy? Does that make right. him evil in, in, in the context of uh, how most would define evil. I, I wouldn't define that as evil. I would disagree with him. But again, what they've done is a really good job of starting to blur the lines uh, between black and white in terms of, of what's really right or wrong in that context. And not that there's not a right or wrong, but in terms of the compelling story, storytelling in the we, it's the, it, it's the questions that we ask ourselves the thought-provoking things that make it interesting, that make it make for good writing. And that's what it does. It asks, asks those questions. It doesn't make it right. It doesn't mean I'm going to agree. But here, it's, you know, it's, it's, there's still good conflict and everything, and it makes a good movie, obviously. But, you yes. know, why the cultural need right now? You know, why do you think that is? I, well, so my hope is that it serves the need of helping us question our own intention and purpose, right? Am I right? Am I a superhero that's 
more correct than than Captain America all the time, and I never do anything wrong, and you're just wrong, and the bad guy, or am I human and you're human, and maybe there's maybe you're not bad and I'm not bad. Yeah, because I mean, you're even seeing it playing out with Star Wars. You know, <laughs> back in the early '80s uh, or even the late '70s, there was definitive good and evil. Now we're seeing wow. a blurring of those lines in these movies that are coming out. So. Which brings me to the next point is, as an advertiser and a marketer, how do we plan ahead to adjust our messaging in the next five to ten years to accommodate the downswing, the inevitable downswing of the uh, going from, a, you know, the next 20 years, so to speak? Well, we've got a good 13 years before we're in that downswing. So unless right. you're serving a um, an alternative market that that is part of that, that next movement. The, the, a couple of things that we look at. Number one, replace your UVP, your unique value proposition, with a statement of what you stand against. Interesting. Right? Um, I'll fill you, your audience again, but I know very few people that voted for Donald Trump. I know very few people who voted for Hillary Clinton. I know a lot of people who voted against Hillary Clinton. I know a lot of people who voted against Donald Trump. <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> Amazingly true. This is what I'm against. <laughs> That's one of the things I coach people when, when they talk about their messaging. Well, we need to beat our, sh our chest and tell them what we're... I'm like, why don't you tell them what you don't do and what you, you're not going to do for people? That's interesting. It is. And, yeah. and in fact, when you do that, um, we've seen for our clients a, an average increase of 26% in growth revenue. Oh, when you actually implore that messaging. Yep. yep. When you when you remove your UVP and replace it with what you stand against, people have a stronger today, not tomorrow, but today have a stronger emotional connection with what you stand against than what you stand for. And if, if it's clear enough what you stand against, then what you stand for is obvious. Right, right. It'll be implied. So for me... I stand against douchebag marketers, right? <laughs> As do I. <laughs> there you go. Douchebag marketers. That's hilarious. Um, what can people really, uh, you know, anticipate in the next, you know, just overall culturally? What What do you think is going to start playing out? Predict the future. Well, Right now, we can so politics and mainstream politics are <clears throat> really impacting the fabric of Western society. And when we look in the United States, the current impeachment proceedings and the the Senate's likely acquittal and the upcoming presidential elections um, are dividing um, the country more and more and more. And that's only going to get worse. Um, and I suspect that the that the Democratic candidate for president will be equally as divisive as Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And then eventually things will have to eventually turn. I mean, people are the cultural uh, fabric will start to turn and, and get kind of tired of the division. Hopefully. Well. I mean, when we went through this 160 years ago, we had a civil war, right? True. So there are some extreme levels that we can get to um, within the current cycle that we're in. Um, the hope is that we have enough garbage hell that goes on that we decide to take a break. Mm -hmm. The fear is that we don't. Well, the fear is Based that we that, that it continues to get worse and worse and worse until we have some sort of uh, cultural uprising that's going to be yeah yeah well Why? in fact that, and what's interesting about that cultural uprising is that it's not that cultural uprising is not going to present itself in the political sense that in the way that we're talking now that cultural uprising is going to present itself with people checking out mm. does not carry a, apathy more than that, it's going to be shutting down their computer, turning off their phones, moving to the country, and not dealing with each other. Or just dealing with each other more of on a personal level, face-to-face. -face. 
No, I, well, I'm, I'm saying it, it, the, I think that you're going to see mo- movements. You know, in the '60s, we had communes and other things that that built up, right? That we're all about freedom and self-expression. I think you're you're going to see that the probabilities you'll have movements of that to get away from persecution, to get away from people who don't agree. I think you're going to see um, people who get off of social media because they can't deal with the judgment and the, the social proof and all of that. I think we're going to see um, a micro movement of people who actually get off the grid. Interesting. Interesting. I think I could see that happening and playing out because people just get tired of the noise. Yep. Let's just turn it off and turn it down. What are you doing these days, man? Talk and t- promote yourself a bit. What am I doing? Uh, you know, I'm doing the same thing I've always done. We've now promoted 99 consecutive books to the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and New York Times bestsellers list. Um, we've now opened up a video studio office in Salt Lake City, Utah. Mm-hmm. We have. Um, uh, 8,600 feet with seven different studios. Um, we now do something called Platform in a Box, mm-hmm. where we take our book outline process and uh, it takes three hours to do. We end up with 64 topics, and we know what the big idea is, what the story, what the hope and entertainment is. And we put you in the studio and we film you. And then at the end of that, we create 64 videos and 64 podcasts and 64 blog posts and 128 social media uh, posts and 64 memes and a book. And then we make you a bestseller. Um, so we're doing some some fun things with that, being able to expand and share voice. One of the things that, that's important to me is the idea of voice. I believe mm-hmm. that everybody that's born on this planet is born with what I call a sole purpose, an S-O-U-L purpose. And that sole purpose isn't for you, but rather for your fellow man. You're here to serve each other, which is in contrast to what happens often in the uh, wish hunt cycle. Yeah. And... My sole purpose, my agency's sole, sole purpose, is to help folks find, test, and amplify their voice. It's, I think, one of the most important things. And I would even suggest in a witch on cycle, if every American, if every member, if everyone in the world felt comfortable and confident in sharing their voice, what a different world we would have. So for me, the idea of promoting the, your willingness to share your voice is one of the most important things we get in. And so it's a big focus of what we do is that, that sharing of voice. Is there a set of beliefs that you have to, uh, your clients have not, not, sh- you know, b- not religious or anything, but you know, uh, there, it's a lot better when you work with somebody who you can get behind and have a passion for what they're doing. Is that a prere- prerequisite for what you're doing? Well, so that reminds me of, a, of an article that Roy put together titled the follow your passion myth. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, he says that um, in his experience, and it's mine as well, that he has never in his life met a successful person that became successful by following their passion. <laughs> That's idealistic. <laughs> but rather, successful people are passionate about whatever they choose to do. You don't follow your passion, you let your passion follow you. Mm-hmm. Right. And so. For me, the, it's the, it's not – I can be passionate about anything. I can be passionate about Star Wars. I can be passionate about going to the Wizard Academy. I can be passionate about writing. It, it, passion's a choice. It's an emotion, but it's still a choice. But knowing what you're here to do is important. So it, it's not about passion. It's about the willingness to go out and do something. Hemingway said um, the difference between a writer and a non-writer is that the writer wrote. Yeah. Right? The writer did the thing. They they wrote it. I also said, um, write drunk, get it sober, and there's no such thing as a good writer, only a good editor. But irrespective of all of that, it's about the willingness to go and do it. I am not – look, I'm smart. You, you, you gave me great accolades to start off with. I'm not an idiot by any stretch of the imagination. There's a lot of – there are a lot more brilliant people on this planet than me. The difference between myself and most is that I've dedicated myself – to an outcome. I've gone out and I've done the work. I went out and I figured things out and I didn't allow obstacles to stop myself from doing it. Most people live their life as a victim or as entitled. 
and they're not therefore willing to put in the work. Well, I'm a high school dropout, right? I, really? I, I have, yep. Did not know that. I have 26 learning disabilities. <laughs> I have a lot of things that I have to work through to be able to do what I do. It's the, the, the thing that allows me to have success is my willingness and actual taking the action, mm -hmm. right? That's it. That's why I said going back to the idea of voice. Imagine a world where everybody felt safe and secure enough that they were willing to share their, their voice, their, their thoughts, their ideas, their visions with each other. If we could authentically talk with each other, like fundamentally at the court, the smallest level, if we just talk to each other and we were secure in sharing our voice, it would be a very different world. Well, I mean, so a lot of me, people are sharing their voice these days. That's for sure. Whether I it's don't authentic think. Is, is I don't thing. think hiding yourself behind a a username on YouTube, Facebook, or social media, and yelling at someone because you disagree with them and calling them names is sharing your voice. I think that's sharing hate. I think that's getting into the dark side. Right. That's that's that's, <laughs> that's getting into the worst parts of the uh, of who we are as a human being and giving in to the witch hunt. But if you can accept that most people most of the time intend to do good and are good people. And if you're willing to authentically, transparently share your voice, not behind some facade. Right. If you're willing to do that, that's awesome. You know, when um, Glenn Beck who I often don't agree with, but when Glenn Beck read Pendulum on Air, I got death threats. Now, that's fine. I'm not complaining about that. I'm more using that to, to share the example. I had the courage, Roy had the courage to write and publish that book. We had the courage to be able to share that with people that we agreed and dis disagreed with. And we started a dialogue and conversation. It's why you and I enjoy these conversations because we have this dialogue in this conversation. I'm confident that you don't agree with it, every point that I have or position or belief that I have. Right. And that's okay. And I wouldn't share, and I'm certain that that's true on the inverse. But we're willing to have the conversation. We're willing to, to share our voice in a real authentic way that's transparent. And that's what's important. Even if, yeah, and if you have people that disagree with you, that's okay. I mean, you're still sharing your thoughts yeah. and you're not disguising them. There's so many people out there that we follow that are, you know, the veneer is highly polished. And I've always said, I'm like, how does that, how is that working? You know, and it's, it, you know, it, what, so we use this phrase, I use this phrase that you, you quoted me, douchebag marketing. But you know what? We say that and it's derogatory. And yet at the same time, I'll go on Ryan Dice's stage and call people douchebags. Mm hmm. Right? I will go to Frank Kern's face and call him a douchebag and we'll have a dialogue and conversation about it. Frank right? Kern? I mean, yes. Yeah. I'm willing. I'm, <laughs> I listen to I'm those not, podcasts and I go, how are people taking this I'm, guy seriously? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not holding a facade that's <clears throat> protecting me from calling it out. Yeah. Hell, I've been a douchebag, right? I'm willing to accept my own flaws. I could do that because I'm willing to have the conversation and the and the other people are willing to have the conversation back. Yeah. Right. But if you get offended and you're not willing to listen without needing to respond, then you're only looking to validate your own position. Well, that's the thing. If you, if upon being coined a douchebag marketer, if your response is, yeah, I could see that, then you're open to have a good conversation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, it's it's the concept of you're flawed. I'm I'm flawed. You're flawed. Let's yeah. accept that, and then let's let's be open to it. Um, it's funny the the actual concept of of douchebag marketing as a concept came up in a conversation between Jeffrey Eisenberg, Alex Mendozian, and myself. Right, and all three of us could be accused at some point in our life of being a douchebag marketer. That's okay, right? It's but but if if we're open to that, we're willing to have the conversation. Then we can talk through what are the characteristics, why did I do that, what can be what can be taught to other people, right? There's a huge, massive value in accepting that you've done something that isn't ideal because it, you had a reason for it at the time. Well, I mean, I think a lot of the, the the reason like in a lot of the guys that we talk about, you know, Grant Cardone being one of them, and I'm a I like Grant, I, you know, I'm I do a lot of the voicing for him and stuff like that. I'm more than happy to 
to be a part of his organization. Everybody I've dealt with down there has been very pleasant. Uh, I've talked to him personally. He's, he's you know he's a ve- he's a different thinking person. He's loud, but he understands that's how he gets the attention by saying you know sensationalistic things at times that that will get him attention. That's his game. That's his play. Um, but at the same time, the dude's got 35, 40 years of hard knocks grind to back oh, it yeah. up. Okay. Vaynerchuk is just straight to the heart. This is what I think. I don't care if you disagree with me. I know my self awareness, and that's what I share. And that's that's his un. I, I I've never met him in person, but I don't think that he's uh, all that different in person than he is in front of a camera. You know. No, I'm he's the same person. Yeah, but I mean, you know, even with Roy, Roy's very. Uh, in, in meetings with him early on, he was very. He would say things that would make you go, "Whoa!" You know. Uh, <laughs> dropping you know swearing and, and general public and everything and it, and a lot of people were kind of like that's but that was who he was who he is i'd love well, to interview him but he's a tough dude to get a hold of and that the risk of insults is the price of clarity yeah yeah absolutely every single time how's he doing these days Ah, uh, he's great the the academy's going well he actually just uh stepped down and let daniel Whittington become the chancellor of the academy so he's starting to move out of the academy it's, it's kind of fun to see him uh, get ready to retire so um, well, I, I can't have, i can't see him golfing every day no he'll be writing he'll be writing. writing fiction oh okay i can see that well man how can people get a hold of you and follow you and everything so you know we've uh, recently merged our company with um uh with david mccann's company cranberry we're now profluent mm-hmm. so you go to profluent.com p-r-o-f-l-u-e-n-t.com my email is pretty simple. It's michael at profluent.com, M-I-C-H-A-E-L at P-R-O-F-L-U-E-N-T dot com. Um, you know, send me an email. Uh, happy to, to talk. We're always out there uh, looking for the uh, new influencers and thought leaders that want to replace those douchebags. <laughs> and any uh, plan for a podcast down the road for you? <clears throat> You know what? At some point, we, we, we talked about this before the call. There's like a cobbler shoes kids issue thing, yeah, yeah. and it's so easy to to do for others, and it's a little bit more difficult to do for yourself. And so, yeah, at some point, I, I need to I need to do it for myself. But uh, right now, I'm having fun um, uh, helping my clients change the world. So. There's, there's got to be a a uh, podcast for Pendulum. I mean, it's and to follow the events as they unfold. You know what? Something um, like that. Where I'm, I'm looking at doing an update to the book Pendulum and adding in a finding Don Quixote section, um, and talking more about the witch hunt. So we'll see. There very well may be something uh, between now and uh, and the election, uh, the presidential election this fall. Right on. Well, man, thanks for joining me again. Uh, for those of you who are listening, thanks for hanging in there. <laughs> if you have been hanging in there over the time, uh, and I'll try to make these things a little bit more regular. So if you can, please follow me. You can find all my social handles at Jim McCarthy And, uh, Hey, reach out. If you have a thought, if you have somebody that I should consider bringing on, why not? If you have a question about voiceover or marketing or anything, you can email myself or Michael, of course. And uh, again, brother, thanks for being on with me. Always. I always enjoy being on. This is the JMVO Weekly Primer. Please subscribe, rate, and comment via Jim McCarthy Voiceovers.com forward slash podcast.